Hello, thank you all for coming. My name is Lolita Cross, and I am the founder and the curator of the Salon of the Wing, which is the permanent exhibition on you in all spaces. Uh, for tonight's Salon series, I'm thrilled to be introducing Salon artist Chabalala Self, who is featured in the Soho space. Um, Self combines painting, printmaking, and some last to explore ideas surrounding the black female body, constructed with a combination of sewn, printed, and painted materials. Her exaggerated depictions of bodies traverse a variety of artistic and craft traditions. She received a BA from Bar College and an MFA from Yale University and is the recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculpture Grant. Her work has been including in solo and group exhibitions at the Youth Museum in Shanghai, the New Museum, and uh, most recently the Hammond Museum in LA, which we'll be talking about a little bit more. She's currently an artist in residency, an artist in residence uh, at the Studio Museum in Harlem, and she'll be part of a three-person show this summer at MoMA PS1 in collaboration with the Studio Museum, which is under renovation. So, how did you start making art, uh, and why? What was the what was the first click, and when did you realize like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this thing? Um, I guess I've always made work, and. As I got older, maybe around high school age, I, did, I had like a really strong interest in art and maybe figuring out what it meant to be like a professional artist. So I did a lot of internships during that time. And then when I went to college, the bar, that school was really, well, we went to bar together. So it's like, yeah. the bar's a liberal, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but bar's a liberal arts school, but it's, um, it's kind of it's an art school. It's a very, I mean, it's very it encourages people to kind of um, pursue various elements of the arts: writing, acting, playwriting, fine art, sculpture, performance art. So in that environment, I feel like my interests really thrived, and I studied art there. I was a studio art major. Um, after graduating from Bard, I came back home. And I tried to find work for a while, like in my field. I guess my field at that time would have just had like a BA in studio art. It's kind of difficult for me to find very you much. Were trying work. to find work like nine to five at an office, or you trying to find like assisting other artists? I'm trying to find work as an assisting artist. Trying to find work maybe teaching art, but I didn't get really much traction doing it, doing either of that. So um, I decided to apply to grad school that year. And then during that year is when I got into my MFA program. Um, between maybe toward, towards the end of my um, time in undergrad, I was kind of looking at other people who I saw out in the world that kind of reflected aspects of myself that I thought, oh, okay, well, they're kind of doing things I would like to do. So maybe I was looking at artists like Mikkeli Thomas or I guess she moved to. And I was thinking, like, I wonder how they got from point A to point B. I guess point A being like this desire to make art and share art with a larger audience other than yourself or those around you. And then um, point B being at the point where they had um, a platform and they had an audience to share artwork with. That audience being provided partially through like, you know, people that were interested in their art, but also the platform that maybe a gallery or institution could allow. Um, so in doing that research, um, that's kind of how I landed on applying to Yale for my MFA because I saw that a lot of those artists that I admired had gone through that program. So that's why I initially applied to that school and I went there and I think ultimately for what, I, what I'm doing at this point and what I like to, how I like to function within making my art, it was a good decision for me. I don't think grad school is necessary for everyone who's a maker, but I think depending on what kind of trajectory you're interested in having, it, it could make more sense. You're someone that I guess sees yourself maybe working within the institution to some degree, or working within within a gallery. Then I think it's probably a good decision. But um, and when yeah. you were so you said you started making art when you were in high school. What kind of art were you making? Were you a drawer or were you because you studied printmaking when you went to Bard? So at what yeah. what point did you start switching? And and if so, what was your interest originally? Well, I've I've always made art like even as a child, but. Um, in high school, I started taking art classes. So I went to Harlem School of the Arts, like after school, it's like after school program. And I did drawings and paintings and I guess like different other kinds of like craft oriented things that you know, like middle, middle school age children do. Right. Um, then in high school, I had um, very, very attentive um, art teachers. So at that point, I just spent a lot of time with the teachers and the art department there. 
And I would stay there like after school, during lunch, during my lunch break, and they were super supportive and very cool temperament. They're like total artists. So we spent like, I kind of treated it like my studio, even though it was like a classroom. So I would do drawings there, paintings. At Bard, I became mostly interested in printmaking. And that's because it was like the first time I had learned a, I guess, a more technical skill. So I kind of became in love with the process. And it was something really validating about learning a process and then applying that process to a way of working and then having this output that was unique to the, to the process. So making process-oriented work or skill-based work I felt like that was very exciting. So at Bard, I really focused on that. And even though now I'm not doing printmaking as much anymore, I still feel like my work is very um, process oriented. Yeah. And I have that from my all the time spent doing printmaking. Also, I enjoyed how, the, um, how a tool can kind of extend your intention. So before, when I was doing the model prints, the printing press was an extension of my hand, but now it's more the sewing machine. And I kind of, I kind of enjoy that kind of engagement with the uh, object or mechanism outside of myself. Yeah, and you, how did you get into sewing? Because I believe your mother was, was making clothes, and so you kind of caught it from her. Well, my mom, she would do that like as a hobby. Yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah, my mom would make, she could make like a whole outfit. Um, and my sisters, when they would like outgrow jeans, she would turn them into like skirts or mini skirts or things like that. She would make our Easter clothing, all the drapes around the house, pillows. But um, my mom's like, day job, she actually ran a trade program at Bronx Community College. So I kind of always thought about art as being like a trade of sorts. So I kind of feel like my relationship to making, both formally and conceptually, both very much inspired by my mother because she ran this program that kind of helped. Um, it was mostly, she had mostly men in her program, but people that maybe had some kind of youth um, disenfranchisement. So people that dealt with like youth incarceration or people that were experiencing discrimination from the trade unions. So these are maybe like the Con Edison Union, the Carpenters Union. Um, most of her students were black and Latino. So a lot of times in trying to join the union, they got some pushback. So she acted as a liaison between the, her students and the union reps. And she also provided training. So um, her whole program was kind of oriented around that. So the idea of having a career in which you like work with your hands or you make an output that is then something that you sell or share, that was like very much accepted, I guess, like within like my household. Apart from that, my father was like a writer. I mean, that's the whole reason my parents moved up to New York from New Orleans. Because my dad was getting his MFA in writing at Columbia. But yeah, so between like, in that kind of milieu within the household, it fit, I had a kind of a good environment, I guess, to pursue making. But I had to, um, I guess for me to be supported, it had to be treated like a, like a, a real skill. So it was encouraging me to go to school and to study it and to learn as much about it as possible. So that was kind of my attitude towards it. And then my mother was the first person I ever knew who like, sewed things or made, or made any kind of object or art with the sewing machine. So I definitely think that that's why I sew as well. I mean, I never sewed while, when I was younger, I never like, learned how to sew from her or anything. But I wish I had paid more attention actually to that retrospect. But it's interesting because you used a sewing machine and you used the, the threads on it like a, like a push point, like a pencil mark or something to really like create forms around the bodies. Yeah, so the, um, the stitch line has two purposes. Um, the main purpose for it is that it is a kind of utilitarian purpose. It holds and binds everything together. Because um, these works are all essentially collaged, but there's no glue that's used. Um, the only thing that binds all the various elements together is the sewing. And I kind of landed on that because in the past, when I was trying to figure out how to make the kind of work I wanted to make that had that kind of incorporated assemblage, incorporated collage, um, I tried using glue, but using glue on canvas just didn't make much sense because the glue would kind of corrupt the sizing of the canvas and it wasn't able to stretch properly. And but the knot, this is one of those pieces actually, when I was first was gluing, like paper and those kind of elements directly onto 
already stretched canvas. Um, it just wasn't functioning and looking and acting like traditional painting. And because I really wanted to engage in that conversation, I had to find a way to kind of remain true to the aesthetic that I was developing, but also have the canvas function like painting. Um, so sewing ended up working out because uh, um, with sewing, everything is able to be held together very, very strong, very strongly, but there is no corruption really done to the canvas. The canvas can still move and be stretched like, a norm, like it normally would be. And also, too, I, it's so much easier to change and move the various elements that build up the figure. So if I place a part of the body down or element from the figure down, if I change my mind about it to remove it, I just have to remove the stitch. When you're gluing things together, it's a little bit more, it's a more final decision. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Because you repurpose your own work a lot. Yeah, so for paintings that I feel like have failed or for works that were not successful or older pieces that were unfinished, all that kind of stuff becomes like debris or material for new works. So all that stuff is held in the studio and everything's kind of reused in that way. And basically anything that is relatively two-dimensional that can fit through the sewing machine, I you know, think about as something that could possibly be used for the paintings. Um, yeah, even things that just come into the studio by happenstance, like the, the bag from the store, U-line packing, all that stuff can be incorporated into the works. It's very patchwork. I feel like you get your inspiration from writing, from pop culture originally. I know mm -hmm. the female figures we're depicting were mostly inspired by that, and then I think it switched to a little bit more personal figures or yeah. historical figures. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so when I was um, when I was at Bar during my time at undergrad, I was really fascinated with like pop cultural images and repurposing those images and giving new meaning to those images. Um, I felt like that was a really, really important cause, but I became kind of disillusioned with that or kind of just interested in that as I was in graduate school and also as I kind of came older, I just felt like it was more productive for me to produce my own kinds of images um, instead of combating images that were already existing that I um, had issues with. So um, I started kind of producing my own kinds of images and my own kinds of narratives around the figures that I, were, I was making. But then um, I started to be kind of looking even more introspectively about it uh, more recently. and kind of diving more into more personal narratives and trying to pull figures and stories and ideas from my own, my own lived experience. I feel like in that way it's more sincere and actually and oddly enough is actually more universal to kind of talk about your own experience because I think the more sincere of a story you can articulate, actually the more people I have access to it just because I think honesty is a little bit more accessible than um, cultural tropes and whatnot. Also because I think no one can tell you how they don't feel about you. Like I feel like your own personal experience is always something that can be read as universal, but is perceived as something that's going to be personal and therefore is your own vision of things. I think that's part of it as well. I mean, people can still have their own, people will and do still have their own opinions about things, but you know, because even though you're telling your own story, you're still telling it from a particular perspective. So uh, people can still question a perspective, you know, but yeah. I'm open to that. It's part of the fun of how making things, of being in the world. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the the fabric and, and the idea of of uh, patchworking ideas together, because you have some works that are uh, more straight on, like this is a neon. Uh, other works is just directly work on a blank page of paper. What's your relationship with the blank canvas? Are you are you afraid of it, or or do you find it inspiring? Do you and things on paper before, and then you apply them on canvas. What's your process like? Well, a number of the work, a, lot, a number of the works from the slideshow are from a very particular series. Um, I did called the um, Bodega Run, yeah. and that's the series that was most recently at the Hammer. Um, so those pieces, all the figures and the entire narrative surrounding them, is situated within a particular place, and that place is meant to be the Bodega. Um, so for those works. And kind of naming and kind of naming the environment that the figures were in was very important. Um, I feel like my other works run parallel to that series, and those are the works maybe when you see a figure and they're in a kind of a blank space, a liminal space, a color field. And those places are not so much about naming or 
describing any particular place because figures are meant to be engaged in a certain kind of psychological or emotional um, moment. And it wasn't so important for me to kind of give speak, name the space in which they were in, like situated in reality. I had made works like that for a very long time. So you look at a lot of the earlier works, the works on paper, the figures are just in a liminal space. So for me, I kind of wanted to give myself like a a prop, like a prompt, like both conceptual and formally a challenge to place my figures within an environment. And I landed on the bodega as kind of the first environment to explore because it seemed like if my figures were to be real, this seemed like a realistic um, place in which maybe I would run into them if they were real people or something. Can you talk about bodega and what it means to you and why you came up with the bodega in specific? Uh, I, mean, I think it was like in 2015 I had made a painting called Bodega Run. And then when I tried to do some of the, the larger series, I like to maybe kind of extract an idea from an older piece. Um, what first attracted me to the space was that I felt like the bodega held a lot of the... Um, iconographic and symbolic significance that I was ex I was interested in within the, the community surrounding it. So I felt like a lot of times with the figures that I did pick, I tried to create a um, I tried to create this form or this person, this character that can speak to a larger our larger community. Um, and I feel like the bodega similarly, even though it was one particular space, it spoke to a, a it spoke to a larger community outside of itself. It almost was like a mirror to it. Um, so that's kind of why I first landed on it. And then as I was working on the individual pieces, kind of diving deeper into the project, the more interesting things kind of started to like unfold to me as like why this space is significant. Um, primarily thinking about like why in the first place do these spaces exist, how do they function, who do they function for. A lot of the same questions that I ask about the figures or the not so much the figures themselves, but the image of them. Right. So it seemed to be like a lot of yeah, so it seemed to be like a lot of correlations between my relationship to the my just my purely figurative work and in this environment. So yeah, that's kind of why I was first interested in it. And as I kept working on it, the project became increasingly more complex. You showed, is this on? No, I just turned on, sorry guys. Um, hello? Whatever. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> uh, you showed the bodega uh, installation at the Pilar Correa's Gallery in London. You showed it at the Hammond Museum. You showed it at the Youth Museum in Shanghai. Um, each, can you guys hear me when I talk about this again? Yeah. Um, each of those spaces are, well, to me, Bodega represents the number one victim of gentrification. Like, it's the first thing that goes away as soon as, like, a neighborhood moves. And, you know, galleries and museums are the first signs of a gentrification. What was it like showing your work uh, in such, like, in such gentrified spaces? Well, I mean, I grew up in Harlem, and there's always been museums in Harlem. Like, the Schomburg is a museum in Harlem. It was actually started by an um, Afro-Puerican um, historian named Schomburg. He created that museum because when he was younger, and he was still in Puerto Rico, he was told by a professor that um, black people had never contributed anything to culture. So he kind of, he made it his mission to collect every single thing that black people oh, have ever yeah. Had ever create had ever contributed to culture society. So that museum, which is also a library, is on 135th Street, and that's been there through thick and thin in Harlem. So that's been there for a very long time. And then the Studio Museum is also in Harlem, and there are other institutions that maybe might not be as patronized by you know the people in the city at large, but within the community, they're a cultural, the you know the, their cultural venues, and people definitely engage with them and go to them or whatnot. Um, for me, I think it's important for the work to be at, to, to, to be within the institution because for me, it wouldn't be enough for um, the paintings and these products that exist within the gallery. Now, I would agree with you that a gallery functions very differently than a museum. So to see a gallery or something like that in Harlem, it, that is, I think is a sign generally of gentrification because a gallery is a commercial space. 
So now when you're talking, talking to commerce and transactional spaces, um, that's where I think the issue of gentrification becomes more obvious. But that's another reason why I thought that this project was, it was also commentary to have this kind of um, project at a gallery because it's like, a gallery is a store. I mean, it's a store that's imbued with all this symbology, yeah. but it's a store. And it's a store for a very particular kind of person. Mm -hmm. And a bodega is a store for a very particular kind of person as well. But it's on, a different, it's on different ends of the same spectrum of what kinds of transactional spaces are certain people offered, offer access to, you know? And within those spaces, of what, of what value are the objects they're sold for, you know? And who has access to these things? So for me, it made a lot of sense to have the project within the gallery. When the project went to the institution, so when we had the use and the hammer, it wasn't really my priority to highlight that part about it. It's more to kind of talk about what is the, um, like what's the purpose of a bodega? How is it functioning? Why, is this, why are these kind of stores here? Kind of talking about it more from an anthropological or sociological perspective. But when having this show at the, ga at the gallery when I had a floor choreos, I was kind of thinking about what's the significance of these kind of transactional spaces, ones that are rarefied and ones that are populous. Mm -hmm. So, Was that your first installation, as immersive as, as that was? It was. So the other good thing, I mean, within my practice about working on this project was allowed me to kind of enter into installation, which I haven't done before. Um, and to be less literal to in some of the sculptural works, so that I was able to make some fabricated pieces and pieces that didn't, uh, didn't obviously engage with the figure at all. So that was interesting for me as well. That was productive. It feels like a natural evolution because some of your work is so much about movement. You talked about your, your pieces always being, if you can talk a little bit more about that, because it's more interesting to hear it from you, but the movement in your, in your 2D work. Yeah, um, I always try to have some kind of element of movement with, um, with the work, sort of me for the most part, just because I feel like um, for the figures to look as if they're moving or they have the ability to move, it, it lends them some kind of agency. So it's not as if they are stuck or sitting or posing within the picture frame, it's more as if they are kind of going about um, their own lives and then the viewer is happening upon them. Because I didn't necessarily want the figures to appear that they were performing for the viewer. And the figures are not there for the viewer's edification at all. They're just there, you know, existing. And the viewer is kind of having a, kind of, this is almost like, they're vignettes maybe into these figures' lives or their internal lives or actual lives. Do you feel like the viewer is peeking into their lives? Is there a voyeuristic aspect behind it? I do feel like the viewer takes the, the role of the voyeur with these works, yeah. Most of them, not always. Each work has maybe a different tone to it. I would say the majority of the time, yeah. Um, and so how did that turn into installation? I, caught, I feel like I caught you doing that. At what point yeah. were, you, were you like, okay, I'm not going to try to bring this into a larger format and have the viewer be part of the painting? Well, when I was thinking about the Bodega Project, voyeurism wasn't at the forefront of my mind, but as I started to unpack the space, um, the presence of surveillance started to kind of yes. substitute what who, the, the voyeuristic aspects of what they, what, or that voyeuristic, the gaze that would normally be a voyeuristic gaze in a more figurative work, so when the figures are projected into the liminal space, had become a, a gaze of surveillance within the Bodega project. Yeah, there's actually a really, I forgot to install the, uh, to add the installation view, but there's a really good photo uh, on your website of, uh, of those like, like bumped mirrors that you have in Bodega so that people can peek into oh, yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, the convex mirrors, yeah. Yeah, convex mirror. Um, I didn't know that, it's interesting. It's a really good, it's a really good point. I feel like there's so much surveillance in all those spaces and they're peeking in a different way. <laughs> um, I forgot what my next question was. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, the, the mirror pieces. There are some pieces, I think I included some slides in it, that are mirror. Can you talk a little bit more about, about those? Because it felt so different than your usual work. Yeah, so I, the first mirror piece I made was for a show I did at T290, T290 Gallery in Naples. And that show was made in my first attempt at trying to maybe create an environment. Um, show was called The Function. and 
it was kind of meant to be like a house party and all the different paintings were, were meant to show different figures at that party. The one figure that was a male cut out on mirrored plexi, um, I kind of imagined him to kind of be maybe a wallflower. Um, and the fact that the reason why he was mirrored was because um, I imagined that the, the, the reflection, the reflective nature of the sculpture made it seem as if the sculpture was looking. So it kind of, the, 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 that figure himself was kind of meant to be the voyeur within that space. So the fact that it's reflective meant to kind, of, to kind of articulate the fact that this figure was actually looking, looking at the viewer, looking at the other figures in the paintings and whatnot. But also that the viewer all of a sudden is speaking at themselves. And so they're becoming part of their own gaze. Depending on which angle. So if you're standing directly in front of the work, you see yourself. If you're, direct, if you're standing um, to the side of the work, you see the other works in the space. Interesting. Yeah. I love that. Um, how has your work been received in different countries? Because you've, you've traveled quite a bit, and your shows have traveled with you. And so how, do you feel like there's a different reception in Naples, for instance, than there is in Shanghai? or, or your work is so New York centric, especially obviously with that installation, but in general it's so American. How can you describe people's reactions around it? Well, it was interesting to bring the Bodega project to Shanghai because um, what I learned while I was there was that Shanghai is like has the largest port in the world. So Shanghai is actually a city that's like very familiar with commerce, it appears to be, and especially Shanghai as it is now. And it's a city that has grown tremendously like since 1990. So I feel like for, in that context, the show was really understood in the aspects of which I was just talking more about a transactional space. And also it's a huge mall culture there. So I feel like people kind of entered into the, um, the, the project with that understanding. Some of the other nuances that were maybe more like USA specific in regards to some of the sociological phenomenon of the store and um, some of the ways in which it can play into like identity politics. I don't think that those translated, but I don't think they necessarily had to because um, the, very simplistically, the store is, the, the product is about a store that's for people who are have-nots. And because of the moment that's, that China is in right now, I think that's very much understood, the idea of some people having a lot, some people having nothing. And the people who have nothing, what do those people have access to? So I feel like um, that was kind of the, the entry point for the audiences there. And I think that they were very excited about the project. Also, it was, um, it was actually a huge turnout for the show at the Youth Museum, and the audience there was very much engaged with the project, asked like, a lot of questions, very curious about guess, my history as an artist, and also um, more questions about the inspiration for this specific show, so like New York City, Bodega, Harlem. So it was kind of, it was a really generative, generative experience. Um, I guess kind of went off subject, but in each city, the work is understood slightly differently, but um, so? I guess like when I'm abroad, maybe the work is understood more as um, within like thinking about it as work from, you know, from America. Um, when I'm within America, the work is understood as like work from a black American, you know? So <laughs> that's kind of like the difference. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's kind of, I'm still, I'm still figuring that all out. Because I have been showing the work maybe for like five years now. Um, so I don't know, and also when you're, when you're traveling and you're someplace else, I mean, a lot of times, at least for me, I'm still like, so concerned with like, the show, making sure everything's right. going well. I don't know if I've quite yet gauged like, how other people are responding. I'm still so much in my head usually when I'm doing these things. Um, but I know here is a lot of times when you're showing your work, and then not just for me, I mean, like a lot of artists feel this way, that a lot of times the conversation around your practice or your, your work becomes very much tied to like identity politics. Yeah. Which I think is totally appropriate, and I think that makes absolute sense. But the only issue I have is that with that is that I don't think people understand that everyone's work is a kind of reflection of the identity. So I guess my work is no more about my identity as like a black woman than like maybe Arasha Berg is finding more about his work as a white man. You know, yeah. that's the only conversation I feel like. I said for the conversation good to have. I feel like everyone should. Expected to, to participate in the conversation. Yeah, but usually it's only certain people that are 
um, expected to participate in talking about that element of their practice. Yeah. Do you, there's a question that comes back a lot to me when people ask me, because I work with so many female identifying artists, they ask me if I am a feminist and if the artist, every single artist I work with is a feminist. And I feel like you would never ask the question to a man. Um, yeah. How, what would you answer to that question? Yeah, I'm a feminist. I mean, I believe that women should have, if it, I guess if the question of being a feminist is like, should women have equal rights as men, then yeah, I mean, like, I, obviously I feel that way, you know? I mean, if anything, I think people should be, have rights based on what they contribute. And if women contribute more, then maybe I wouldn't be a feminist, because maybe they should have more rights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Um, wait, I had a question about, um, but to highlight in your career so fast. I feel like you're, you're one of those artists that all eyes are on. There's, you know, your career kind of like blew up right after you graduated from, from Yale. You had the group shot at the studio museum and then you kind of like went on with a bunch of galleries. What was the scariest part about that and what is also the most exciting part about it, knowing that you know, you're well educated and you know what traps not to fall for? Um, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> You know, you never know when you're in a trap until you're stuck in it, you know? <laughs> um, I guess I'm just, you know, art is very up and down. So I think that for what I try to do, I think what all other makers should do, I mean, even if you're not like a visual artist, if you're a designer, writer, or whatever, you should really stay on top of perfecting your work. So perfecting your work doesn't mean like creating this like finished product that you reproduce over and over again, but just making sure that the work is continuously growing and continuously challenging yourself, actually allowing yourself to have some kind of failures with your work so that at least it can grow. Um, because if, depending on whether or not things go up or down, it's, um, if your work is not strong, what it, what, whatever issues can come out of either of those scenarios will be exasperated by the fact that you don't have a strong foundation. And for us makers, the foundation is just like your, your work, you know? So I feel like for me, maybe the high point, I mean, I've been so many like fun things that have happened since I've been showing my work, like traveling, meeting people I've always wanted to meet, exciting things like that. <coughs> you know, just being, I guess the best part about making my art has been, I think it's made me a lot more confident. Um, so it's been, I guess the, the best thing about it has been things I've learned about myself. And also the scariest things are two things that you might learn about yourself, <laughs> like insecurities, um, fears, certain kinds of, maybe, you know, you might be tempted by certain situations, the questions you might ask yourself, like, am I willing to do that? Will I do that? You know, all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> but so far, you know, I'm really thankful for the platform I've had access to, and, you know, for the people that have supported me with, you know, thus far, my gallerists, my curators, institutions, um, just my peers, people that like like my photos on Instagram, all of that. I mean, it was all all of that is part of what I'm able to do at this point. So, do you feel like you've used Instagram as a platform at all, or I feel like mm -hmm. your career kind of started before Instagram was so heavy? Yeah, I, it it did. I I wasn't so big on Instagram before, but because I was still I was still in grad school, I don't know a lot of people were still using it or not. But I think that Instagram does help because kind of give you a way to gauge how the public feels outside of like the gatekeepers, you know. It's important, I think. I kind of like to put things on Instagram just to see like how real people feel about it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's also important like, to keep in mind that it's people feel real about a picture that they're seeing on this format that That's has true. a light box behind it. That is true. That's actually the best way to look at art. <laughs> <laughs> So I feel like you know, if it looks good there, it definitely will look good in person. If they're impressed with it like this big, when they see it in real life, it'll definitely make an impact. So. Do you think you're going to be moving more towards uh, installation-based work, or what have you been working on while you were at the, or while you are at the residency program? Um, for the residency program, I was kind of taking a lot of what I learned from the installation, but not necessarily applying it so literally. So this installation was like super hyperbolic, and after doing this, I think I kind of wanted to kind of step back a little bit. So all of these pieces that I'm making for the Studio Museum show, they're all meant to be shown together, um, but and they all are kind of create installation within themselves. With installation exists within the paintings, it's not so much in the space. 
Um, the space is more a more neutral space than all the actions in the actual works. So yeah, it's a little different. Is that what you'll be showing at the PS One? Yes, in June when the show opens. Are you excited? I am excited. I've been working Allison, Sable, the we're all the three residents this year. I've been working really hard all year on this body of work. So Allison is another uh, salon artist, Allison Janae Hamilton. She is in Soho uh, on the floor underneath you. Yes, so all of our work will be there at Open PS1, and I think there's a lot of people going to come, a lot of expectation with the museum being closed and everything else. So, yeah, hoping we'll do all do a good job. I'm sure we will. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure. Well, I'm really excited about this one. Um, do you have any advice to young artists? I feel like you kind of touched upon that uh, when you were talking about your highlights, but any more? Yeah, I have advice. Um, I mean, I personally think it's always good to go to art school. I mean, not art school, but go to school for art. Because um, even my, I think at least when you get, when you go to school for it, even if things don't pan out like the way you're hoping, like, oh, I'll have a gallery or I'll do all these shows and I'll be able to have a successful commercial career, you can always still work. Um, you can always still like teach, you can always do so many other things if you actually have like um, schooling. I think that becomes very, very important. Even for artists that have very, very vibrant careers for the commercially, like the bottom can really fall out of that at any point because art is very precarious business. Yeah. So is this good to you know to have something else that you can another skill that you can kind of work with? I mean, that's another reason too why I always enjoy learning different kind of skill based. Um, art making processes like print making or like you know I guess now this, this sewing is not practical sewing at all but I mean if I had done an over I would have actually learned for real how to sew so like making make an outfit or something but um, just my friends I know who are photographers or filmmakers they can always get work even if it's outside of the, their studio work and that can become important you know yeah I feel like you learn from your scholar family that like knowledge is what will save you of any situation. It helps, it really helps. And um, also just a network of people that you'll meet in those kind of places, more so than the faculty or the contacts. Your peers will always really help you. Um, so it's nice to kind of meet those kind of individuals, like-minded people, that kind of thing will stay with you for like a lifetime. Who are some of the artists that you were looking at when you were younger or even that you're looking at now? When I was much younger, I started to love like Michelin Thomas, Kenny Wiley. I feel like yeah. your early work was remind me a lot of Michelin Thomas. Oh my, yeah, I was like, I love them. I mean, I have like, little pictures of their work on the wall. <laughs> but um, yeah, so now I still love those artists. But now I have such I know about so many more artists that I have I'm interested in. I think about like Henry Taylor, Bill Trailer, Faith Ringel. Well, I've actually always loved Frank Faith Ringel. I had her children's book when I was younger, Tar Beach. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. But she's also very fabric heavy. Absolutely, but I always had her book as a child, but it wasn't until I was older and I became aware of her other her body of work. So I was like, oh wow, like I've always had this language in my mind from you know being familiar with this artist mm -hmm. through this children's book. Um, yeah, there's so many artists, but even artists whose works are nothing really to do with my practice. But like Adrian Piper, David Hammonds, those artists kind of think about more conceptually. Yeah. Um, but it still, it still lends a lot to my practice. Yeah, they hit the same way. Mm -hmm. And younger artists also. I feel like you started, you started to look and appreciate younger yeah, artists. Yeah, you sh you've actually shown me a lot of younger artists whose work I really like, like Chase Hall. Chase Hall was really, really amazing. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm still, you know, trying to stay active, figure out, you know, learn more about what's come before me, and like, educate myself more about art. Um, art history. So it's kind of like I'm like kind of taking the approach of teaching myself about things that I have interest in, and also to kind of staying aware of like people who are the new makers who are still make who are making work that I'm not aware of because they're just coming out of school or just they're just showing their work to the world for the first time. And they don't have a platform yet. Exactly. Yeah. Stuff out of there. Um, anyway, I think we can open it up to the question from the audience. If you guys have any questions. I guess, first of all, have you started feeling like pressure from galleries like now that you're kind of in a commerce space as an artist? Do you feel like you're getting pressure from dealers and stuff to like continue making a certain type of work or like having to look at your work as a form of making money? How would you like 
isn't that advice some sort of like how to keep on your own path and like you know or, or have you been dealt with that yet or I don't know. Well, it's like, if, if, to be honest, like, once you know that you can make something and you can sell it for this amount of money, it's hard to unlearn that from your mind. So whenever you're making things, I mean, you're going to be aware of, like, oh, how much this is going to cost, how much money can I as an individual make from selling this, you know? So, yeah, as soon as you start working with a, with a gallery, or even if you're not working with a gallery, as soon as you start selling your work, that's going to become part of your... Um, your, that's going to be in your mind somewhere, you know, as much as you try to en not engage with it. Some people engage with it, actually engaging with it as part of their practice, think about someone like Warhol or something. But um, that's always something that's in your mind. Now, we are people who say that they are unaware of that because it's impossible to not be aware of that because that's like a reality. Um, but in the question about the dealers, um, any dealer that would encourage you to keep making the same kind of work, um, even if it's not something that you're feeling passionate about at the moment, it's, it's, like not, it's not going to be a good person to like, work with at all. Um, because you want to make work that you're feeling passionate about and conceptually and formally make sense for your practice at any given time. So if you have developed um, an idea that has taken your work to a different direction formally, you have to follow that because it's really the ideas behind the work that give it the most power. So um, if your ideas are being restrained because you're triggered at being asked to stay within these kind of aesthetic boundaries, for long term, that's going to hurt you. Even if you feel like you can make X amount of money that year or within that five year span or whatever, long term is going to prevent your work from existing, you know, within, the, maybe within the, the, the canon or within culture at large because it's going to, your work really will become very much married to this commercial relationship. Um, work is always in relationship with that, but you don't want it to be married to that. That's a whole other thing, you know. That's my opinion about it. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask more about the work of the figures in the work. They feel very aware. They're either exposed or exposing themselves um, physically. Yeah, so um, I think yeah, well, most of my figures are either, well, some, a lot of the figures are in profile, but a lot of the figures, I think, by equal amount are kind of facing the viewer or kind of looking out of the picture plane. Um, and I do feel like they, their energy um, is more, more high energy, the sexuality there with the, most of the figures and most of the painting. Not all of them, but most. And I just feel like, I don't know, those are kind of the images that I feel more, I feel more inclined to make. But then also to, I feel like it has to be an, a space allowed for, um, for, for the characters that I'm excited about making for them to have a space to kind of express their, their sexuality or fully live within all the possibilities of their body. Um, for me, I think it relates to like their agency. It relates to like ideas of understanding them as being fully, round characters, so not, not flat characters, but um, I don't personally find them like confrontational, but I do understand why they're like read as such, um, but I think that they are more just standing their, like, their ground. It's not like they are like in conflict with anyone, it's just more like they're kind of claiming space. So to do that, I think that does have to be a certain level of um, force. Like artic like express. Uh, yeah. Adrian is also an artist. She is in downstairs. If you guys have seen the new extension of the of the space, she has three pieces downstairs, uh, and one in DC. Actually, no more than one in DC. She's got a bunch in DC. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing. No problem. Check it out. <laughs> I've always gone to school close to where I was from. Um, I'm from Harlem, so I never really left the tri-state for school. 
I went to Bard for undergrad, which is upstate New York, and um, then I went to Yale, which is in New Haven. It's an hour and a half from Harlem. It's actually even closer than Bard, even though it's in the same state. Um, I think that that helps to some degree. Just be thinking about, okay, if I want to, wherever you, whatever you're calling home at that moment, either it's home to your family or home to all your friends are. Because that affects um, thinking about, even going, if you want to go home back and forth, that's money. So if you're close to wherever you like to go or feel like you need to go, I think that's helpful. It's also, um, you, for schools, you want to out, you want to weigh the cost with the benefit, right? So um, I would say the cost is the risk. And then the benefit is, you know, the benefit to the risk. So some schools, I feel like the offer in my face, are, they're way too expensive. And I also think that they're way too expensive for the, um, for the quality of the degree that they, that they give. So you have to really do research. Like, look out artists who are doing similar things that you would like to do. And kind of maybe just read their CV, get an idea of their trajectory. Um, that will kind of give you a sense of what might fit for you. So maybe artists that are doing similar things you're doing, or maybe artists who you feel like are engaging with a similar kind of topic, or do engaging with a similar kind of work. The school that might be good for a painter might not be the best school for a performance artist, might not be the best school for a sculptor. So the, all those things come into play as well. You want to look at who's teaching at that school at any given time. Some of these schools have reputations from 20 years ago, and they're not the same school anymore. You know? Also, um, sometimes going to school abroad is actually cheaper than going to school in the States. So there are fantastic art schools in London, and some of them are cheaper than going to some of the schools here in the States, even though you would be going away. But for example, if you're someone that's from the Northeast like I am, it's not really a world of difference going to school in LA and going to school in London. They're both five to six hours away. So um, those are all things to consider as well. And if you feel like you want to move forward, but you're not sure if graduate school is the right step, there are lots of fantastic residency programs that are a lot less risk, equal benefit. Scott Hegan, you have the, um, all those great residencies in Amsterdam, for example, like Rice, I think. Yeah, so those are, this might be something to look into as well. And some artists, will honestly, they go to Scott Hegan and they, they skip the whole MFA thing. Yeah. So. What's it called? Scott Hegan? What state is it in? Connecticut? Maine. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Hi, thank you. So I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, and the first is, I'm really curious about your curiosity. Um, you've spoken so much about your interests, um, your influences, and a, a lot of what you've spoken to has been art-centric. And so I'm curious about like opening that oculus and figuring out, like, well, what else are you curious about? What's feeding you and nourishing you as a person and an artist? Like, politics, like are you reading another fiction, are you, you know, like what else are you engaging with as like the material for the ideas that are, um, that are, you know, percolating um, as a maker um, in your head and then, or in your body, wherever they live. Uh, and then my second question is really around, um, you know, the figure of the, you know, the black female body and your relationship to it and as a maker. Um, we haven't necessarily like unpacked all of that and you're engaging with this mythology, this symbology, history of that figure and you've also spoken to how you're also thinking about the interiority and like a whole narrative and psychology perhaps mm -hmm. behind that and so I just wanted to understand more of like your relationship there um, with her. Yes yeah, so well to the first question um, I guess there's a lot of I am mean, kind of an art nerd <laughs> but apart from that there are I have other interests and <laughs> my other interests I guess include um, I spend a lot of time with my family. I'm a, from a large family. I'm one of five children. So um, my immediate family takes a lot of psychological space in my head. Um, I have three sisters and one brother. So that might explain the ratio of women to men in my paintings a little bit. But um, <laughs> that's going to be like kind of in my mind a lot. I love films. I was just telling Lolita I actually went to the MoMA yesterday for the beginning of the April for uh, Retrospective, he's my favorite director. He actually got me and my sister into the after party, which is pretty cool. He's a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, so that was very exciting. They showed my favorite film by him, The Addiction. But the reason why I love him as a director is because um, I feel like the way that he frames New York is the New York that I have most in my mind, which is kind of more like a early 90s New York. Even though I live in New York my whole life, and I was born in 1990. For some reason, when I think about where I'm from, the time is 
the Europe between 1990 and 1997. So I love to see his films or films from that time or like a lot of different pop cultural, I guess, minutia from that time because it, for, some, for some reason that part of my life is very vivid in my imagination. I think partially because I can't really remember it that well. So a lot of it's like half fantasy, half nostalgia, half reality. Um, so I definitely love films. I love like fiction novels. So I'm like rereading Native Son of Black Boy right now. Well, Black Boy is actually not fiction. It's like a memoir. I like memoirs, fiction, um, that kind of stuff. I also watch a lot of like nonsense stuff on YouTube. <laughs> Beauty tutorials are very interesting to me. Um, <laughs> one, because they're informative, but then two, um, kind of the idea of someone modeling themselves or building this aesthetic on themselves is fascinating to me because I feel like I kind of do that with my, I kind of project all of that onto the figures when I'm making them. And I know this is going to sound crazy, but I do love botched because it's amazing to me like how they change and alter their body. I feel like, because for me, it's really interesting. And I use some of the techniques when I'm doing my three-dimensional sculptures. <laughs> but obviously not with such precision. Um, well, for example, that sculpture there, the one in the second, the boots, um, half of it's, it has, a, it has like a metal and wooden and plexiglass armature, but for some of the areas to make it more rounded, um, I had to like put in stuffing, like the kind of stuffing you'll put into a pillow. But um, it's always a kind of a mixture between putting stuffing in and picking stuffing out. So I don't know, it's kind of, if anyone has watched Botch and seen the liposuction episodes, yeah. it's kind of a, t a similar technique, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I, like, I, watch, like, I do watch like, a lot of media. I listen to the radio, watch TV, well, like TV and the computer, and then YouTube, books. I should read the Times, but I read the Post, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Washington or New York? Oh, New York Post. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a comic book. Yeah. yeah. And the second question was good too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the second question, I think I'm still, I'm still negotiating that because I, I have my own lived experience in in a black female body, but then I do have a certain responsibility to make work that I think can speak outside of my experience, like of the larger reality of what, how black femininity exists and functions, how black women exist and functions in the world, especially in the context that I'm making work in and living in, which is America. So I'm still negotiating all of that. I don't want to feel like I'm beholden to that history, because I feel like a lot of that history is not accurate, because the people who are telling that history are not, that are not people from, from the community. I feel like a lot of the history, even that I've been program to accept or understand is not even accurate. So it's a lot of unlearning and relearning and self kind of self-educating myself about things that I thought I had an understanding on and I didn't. Like even for example, um, you think about like Rosa Parks. I remember my whole life I thinking that her first formidable, form, formidable contribution to black civil rights was her sitting on, it's like she's not knocking up on the bus, but then um, I just found out recently that she was a prosecutor on a, on a rape case years before that of a black woman that was raped by like three white teenagers um, in the South as well. I, I don't know why I'm forgetting on his name at the moment, but you never, I never learned that. I went to good schools, prep schools. <laughs> I never learned that ever before. I learned that on Instagram and it was verified by Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, yeah, but so even, so even through that kind of thing, I'm starting to realize that I can't, to me, thinking about the history that you want to contend with, you have to first verify what the history really is. There's so much, there's so much misinformation around blackness within America. So that's one thing that I'm contending with with the work, and also as like an individual as well. But then, apart from that, I don't want to feel beholden to this responsibility politic, because I feel like that also is detrimental. I also don't want to feel beholden to a um, kind of like oppression, Olympic kind of, kind of dynamic either. Because I feel like on both ends of the spectrum with this responsibility um, issue and then also the issue of maybe the work constantly being tied to um, what's problematic about the experience of a black woman in America 
you're not allowing for there to be a spectrum of emotions or reality. And when you don't acknowledge all the different aspects of one's reality, like even if you are, have the worst life, there are still moments in which you feel pleasure, you, in which you also feel pain. If you don't acknowledge both those aspects of someone's existence, you're never fully, fully acknowledging their whole humanity. So I feel like with my work, I try to show maybe a spectrum of feelings and realities because um, it's part of my um, my goal in making a like, you know a humane figure. Because um, the issue with particularly women, like black women, is that it's not so much a fight for equality, but still a fight for just humanity. That's like still like the main the main like you know step. So the equality thing that even comes actually later. It's still an issue. It's still, it's still a dissonance between realizing that these are like full people, full capabilities, and full range of emotions and ideas, and you know these interior lives. So, yeah. the, when you're talking about Rosa Parks, you also made a piece on Sarah Bartman. Yes. Uh, which I think is a is a similar story, and I didn't know about her either. And I went through Wikipedia and found out about about her work. And obviously, I don't teach about in France where I'm from, but can you talk a little yeah, bit more about, about her? Yeah, I mean, I, I, her, she came up a lot in my work when I was in graduate school, and I think I didn't know as much about her as I probably should have. I mean, I remember hearing about her because my sister, when I was younger, one of my, one of my sisters has, had mentioned that she was writing about her in a feminist class that she was taking in college. And she was writing about her in relationship to Jennifer Lopez, so this was like 2001. I think, <laughs> which it makes total sense though. It's another woman who is seen as being other, who is a fi cultural fixation with her ass, you know? So I mean, like it was this, it was very similar dynamic actually. So my sister was actually writing an essay about it. That's the first time I had heard the, the name. But it was in graduate school, it came up a lot because of, um, because of the work I was making a lot of figures. You receive them from behind. And I was thinking a lot, I was thinking mostly about maybe more like black American cultural output, like music videos, like a King magazine kind of thing, which I don't know if that's probably still so popular now. But the but that kind of imagery is still very popular, especially on Instagram and whatnot. So I was the the faculty would bring that bring up her a lot as a historical figure that maybe created the context for this. And I I agreed with that to some degree, but to another degree I I, I didn't. Because I felt like within Within the black American community, <laughs> I don't know how many people were aware of her as a historical figure, and I felt like maybe the, inter the interest in that kind of imagery was more based on um, kind of a beauty aesthetic, and they didn't have so much, it wasn't as politicized as, my, as the people within my graduate school program thought it was, or it wasn't politicized in the same direction that they were taking it. I decided to make a work about her because I actually started doing more research about her as an individual. And when I learned more about her, I realized that her story was slightly more complicated than I was told by people that kind of like brought her up in passing. So I had heard that she was like kidnapped and kind of, every story I heard about her completely depleted her of all her agency and power. And she was like this object that was taken from one place to another. But when I did more research into her actual, her life story, I learned that, you know, before she moved to France, she was married, she had a family. I think she lost her child and her husband because of some kind of illness. And then she was given a proposition to go to France for work, to be a performer. And she decided to go and to take this job, but when she got there, the job wasn't what she thought it was going to be, and basically she was slowly but surely trafficked into sex work. So it's actually a story of human trafficking and sex trafficking. And it wasn't, this, she was a woman who had maybe a lot of um, ambition and, um, you know, kind of very brave to make a decision like that at such a young age. And kind of to no fault of her own, she was exploited and taken advantage of. And then once she became, once, once she became sex trafficked and she became ill because of a, um, because of syphilis, she was just discarded. And then when she was discarded and she died, her, her body was like taken and mutilated and killed as this like object, you know? So, and I think they just, it was like recently, maybe 21st century, where they returned her, her corpse to South Africa. 
But um, that's so like the, the what happened to her after her death. That is even almost more is more bizarre and more insane than what happened to her even during her life. Because what happened to her during her life during her life is happening to millions of people right now. But what happened to her after her death? That is what is completely insane story. Yes, yeah. that's true. Any more questions? All right. I think we're done. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Shaba, for your knowledge and your beautiful words. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you.